Good morning. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks uh, for the organizers and GAGS, Dr. Mahmoud Ali, for inviting me, uh, for organizing this really great event and for inviting me to give this talk. It's really an honor. So um, I was one of those that were told to cut my presentation by five minutes, so I might have to fly through my slides. Um, I will talk to you today about the current state of genomic diagnostics for uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. I have nothing to disclose, so I'm breaking my uh, talk into four major parts. First, I'll talk to you about uh, the evolution of genomic tools, mainly sequencing technologies. Then I'll briefly go over neurodevelopment genetics, and then I'll put those together and talk how um, things have evolved in terms of diagnosing uh, neurodevelopment patients and what is the current state of the art testing for this population. And if time allows, I would like to talk to you briefly about our experience at Al Jalila Genomics Center. So let's start with um, genomic tools. So traditionally, a clinician would see a patient uh, do a physical exam, obtain medical history, uh, order uh, whatever investigations needed to get a good um, idea about their phenotype and have a differential diagnosis. And if a genetic etiology is suspected, then they would go uh, send to the genetics lab only to confirm a diagnosis. And this clinical genetic practice was limited by the technology back then, which is Sanger sequencing. I'm pretty sure many of you know this technology. It's um, a bit uh, labor intensive and time consuming. For example, if you have to sequence cystic fibrosis gene, this is 28 exons, so 28 reactions. Usually do, you do it bidirectionally, so you have 56 reactions, and then you have to manually look at traces to identify a mutation. If the clinician is really good with a mix of some good luck, they might find a positive answer. But if the phenotype is broad, and which is the most common scenarios for especially neurodevelopmental disease, the result is negative, and you have to go back into this sequential process again, which in the end will be uh, time-consuming and not very cost-effective. However, something has changed. Next-generation sequencing came up after 2005, which really was a paradigm shift in the practice of clinical genetic testing. And this is because of three main um, developments, I believe. One is the acceleration of the functional annotation of the genome. So the rate of gene discovery exponentially uh, grew. So such that by 2017, 90% of all gene discoveries have been made by this NGS technology. And this also includes neurodevelopmental disorders. So if you query neurodevelopment disease in OMIM or human gene mutation database, you'll find thousands of genes and mutations. And even I tried the Center for Arab Genomic Studies, but here I also looked at multiple congenital anomalies, which are often comorbid with neurodevelopmental disease, and I found uh, above 700 entries related to neurodevelopment disease. So that's number one. Number two, the sequencing of the individuals in the general population has also been accumulating. Um, with um, the latest is the NOMAD database, around 140,000 genomes and exomes across seven or eight ancestries. And this is really key because if I sequence my exome or yours, we will have around tens of thousands of variants. And so we need a good understanding of the normal variation in the population in order to remove variants that are not likely to be disease-causing and focus on ones that are likely to be um, pathogenic. And so. One caveat here, as you can see, the Middle Eastern population is underrepresented, and I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. The last thing is, of course, with this, these gene discoveries and the, the, cost effective, um, uh, the cost effectiveness of next generation sequencing, there has been an explosion of availability of clinical genetic tests. So this data was taken from the genetic test registry, and as you can see, although the number of labs have not changed in the last 10 years or so, the number of tests, genetic tests or diseases has exponentially grown, and now if you go, you will find around 18,000 genetic tests available through this website. And so what happens now is the clinician has options, right? They can do a targeted gene panel for the genes that are unified by the most prominent feature presenting in their patient. Things, if things are a bit more complicated, where there's a multi-system disorder and not a single um, uh, syndrome suspected, you can do uh, whole exome sequencing, which is still a good approach if you've done uh, multiple gene tests and it was negative, and so-called the diagnostic odyssey. Um, this can be um, um, you know, time-consuming, and you'll find lots of variants of uncertain significance. So a middle ground is doing this exome slice approach, where you sequence the whole exome, 
but then focus on the genes that are related to the patient indication. This is very attractive because if negative, you can reflex to another set of genes much easier, and it's more cost effective. And so now we're seeing actually things have been shifting. You know, uh, we still need good phenotyping, but more and more we're seeing that cases are being worked up from a genotype backwards. So there is more uh, genotype-driven delineation, um, maybe equally to phenotype-driven um, diagnosis. But with, with, the, with all these options available to the doctors, the question is how best to utilize the best testing strategy for the patient at hand. And so the general, um, theme is basically phenotyping, right? So the more specific the clinical picture is, the more targeted and focused uh, genetic testing should be. And as things get a bit more broader, you start casting a wider net up to the whole exome. And in between, there is a, there's targeted gene panels, like I mentioned, where you target a group of genes that uh, share the most common feature in your patient. And the trade-off is cost and turnaround time. So the more focused the testing is, the faster the result will be back, and uh, the cheaper it will be. And as you start doing more comprehensive testing, turnaround time will be slower, cost is gonna be higher, and of course, when you do the exome sequencing, you're now opening the whole book, you'll find things that are not related to patient indication, so-called secondary findings. So things get a bit more complicated. So for neurodevelopment disease, where, um, where does it fit in this uh, sp uh, spectrum of genomic diagnostic landscape? Uh, and so for this, let's just briefly define neurodevelopment disorders. Uh, so these are group of diseases affecting the development of the central nervous system leading to abnormal uh, brain function. And so thinking about this, you can imagine the sheer number of biological processes and molecular machineries and genes that can be involved. Uh, neurodevelopmental disorders can present as a one or a combination of motor, speech delay, communication deficits, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, autism, among many other features. And so if you search for any of these terms in OMIM, you'll find hundreds, um, sorry, I'm going. You'll find hundreds and thousands of loci in OMIM, and these could be, um, um, due to mutations that are chromosomal, like copy number variants, or chromosomal rearrangements, or single gene disorders. So the take home from this is, aside from very specific neurodevelopmental disorders, like Fragile X, or P10, or MACP2 related uh, Rett syndrome, uh, the, the genetic landscape is highly heterogeneous. And so unlike diseases like uh, sickle cell achondroplasia, or MINK, where you have a single mutation accounting for all pathogenic variants in patients, or cystic fibrosis where you sequence the whole gene or maybe the 23 common mutation in Caucasians and you're able to catch all pathogenic variants. So you're able to have a targeted gene testing plan, but things in neurodevelopment are a bit blurry and that's because of what I just explained. And of course, because of the genetic heterogeneity, so there are hundreds of genes that can be involved. Each one of those genes contributes thousands of pathogenic variants. A single gene can cause diff multiple different conditions, and there's a lot of clinical overlap. So if a patient comes with uh, a certain neurodevelopment presentation, any gene of hundreds of genes can be responsible. So it doesn't happen quite often that a patient presents and you say it's this gene and this mutation like you would do with the sickle cell. Of course, aside from the uh, specific known uh, syndromes that I mentioned earlier. And so, in this case, comprehensive testing is most likely uh, to be useful. So, what is currently um, the best testing strategy? Um, and I th I'll go briefly to how things have, you know, uh, evolved um, historically. I feel like I'm going faster than when I should, so I'll try to slow down. So, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the conventional karyotype. Um, uh, we all know the limitations. Uh, of this approach, so aberrations less than three or five million bases won't be easily detected. Um, and so, and the assumption here is we're talking about neurodevelopmental disorders where you're highly suspecting a genetic etiology, right? And so if we exclude known chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome, diagnostic yield of karyotype is at best, or has been 3%, right? Later on, chromosomal microarrays came up and many of you know, 
that this is a technology where we, you can have millions uh, of um, molecular markers uh, targeting, sorry, uh, millions of markers. So in our lab, we have a system where we have three million markers distributed across the genome, and so the resolution is much higher and can be lower than 100 KB and even 50 KB in certain regions. The limitation of this approach is that um, you cannot detect balanced rearrangements. But this platform has shown great success, and in 2010, this paper came in the American Journal of Human Genetics, proposing that chromosomal microarrays should be the first year diagnostic test for uh, individuals with developmental delays and multiple congenital anomalies. And the diagnostic yield in this meta-analysis paper was something around 15 to 20%. And so this is inclusive of findings in the karyotype because anything you see in, in the karyotype will, you will catch by microarrays. Very few, less than 0.5% of patients with um, neurodevelopmental disorders had balanced rearrangements. So it's safe to say with microarrays, you can replace karyotype and still have around 15% diagnostic yield. Of course, in 2009 and 2010, um, exome sequence, next generation sequencing came in and clinical exome sequencing was introduced into clinic. Um, there has been a lot of successful publications about the efficiency and the high diagnostic yield of this approach. But it wasn't until last year, again, I, where this consensus statement, again, by the same group that recommended CME 10 years ago, uh, CMA, um, where they said that now exome sequencing should be the first tier testing for uh, patients with neurodevelopmental disorders. This meta-analysis showed that the diagnostic yield is 36%. It's actually 31% for non-syndromic neurodevelopmental disorders and was around 53% for syndromic ones. And so if you add the exome sequencing diagnostic yield, this gets us to 50%. And this is um, in addition to the microarrays because exome sequencing, we still do not reliably catch copy number variants. Most labs, including our lab, we're trying to move into a platform where we can detect CNVs from exomes, and if this, so, if this is so, then the diagnostic, we can replace maybe microarrays, and the diagnostic yield uh, would be 50%. And again, the assumption here is we're talking about neurodevelopmental patients with highly suspected genetic etiologies. So what is next? Um, your patient is, has gone through karyotype, microarrays, and exome sequencing, and I just want to say a note about whole genome sequencing. Um, um, I, I, don't have, um, I don't have it on my diagnostic yield slide, but whole genome advantage is because it um, basically has no enrichment bias, so you don't capture the coding regions. You're sequencing coding and non-coding um, uh, DNA. And so coverage is generally more uniform, and you have coverage in deep intronic regions. So you can really develop uh, bioinformatic tools that can call uh, structural variants and copy number variants in addition to sequence variants. So if, if whole genome sequencing is ready, uh, then it can replace karyotype, microarray, and exome sequencing into a single test. I think its cost is still high, and there are issues with reimbursement. But other than that, Deep intronic variants or regulatory variants that are identified by whole genome, we still don't know what they mean because we don't understand their functional impact. And so now the next thing to do after a negative test using these um, modalities, I think, would be exome reanalysis. So um, just remember that our knowledge about the genome is growing. Currently, we know that five to 7,000 genes are um, that legitimately linked to human disease, and so, um, but this is growing. So every month we're, we're, we're discovering more genes. So if a patient is uh, worked up for exome sequencing today, the gene related to their phenotype might not have been discovered and it's negative. And then later on, if you do um, analysis in two years, the gene that's discovered might turn out to be positive. On the other hand, when we do the exome sequencing, again, it's a snapshot in time, so the clinician presents the phenotype, which is, especially in pediatric settings, um, can be the first presenting feature. And then we do the exome analysis. We look at genes related to this presenting feature, but later on, patient phenotype evolves such that if you give us more information, sorry, we might be able to query other genes and might find a diagnosis, right? So and this is the whole idea of um, exome reanalysis. Few papers came out and showed the 
really utility of exome reanalysis, the most important of which is this paper that came in June last year in New England Journal of Medicine. They presented two cohorts. The first one was the 250 exomes, and they showed that reanalysis of negative exomes in three, four years of time doubles the diagnostic yield. Uh, but they also show a much more representative cohort with 2,000 exomes, and the increment there after th four years of uh, reanalysis was roughly somewhere between 10 to 12 percent. And so if we assume that your patient had a negative exome three years back um, and you want to do an exome reanalysis, we can probably be optimistic and assume that you might have another 10 percent chance that they might find a diagnosis, right? But just Keep in mind that this should be a continuous process, right? Something is negative today might be positive in two years, or might be positive in four years or six years, right? So currently the way it happens is the family or the clinician sees a new gene and they think, yeah, it looks like my patient X. They go ask the lab to look for variants in that gene. So it's very sporadic, or if done through research labs like the paper I showed you, it's more like investigator-initiated uh, study. But so in order to really harness the, the benefit of exome reanalysis, I think labs have to move into more automated systems. So move away from the current approach where it's one-time test. The, the patient phenotype is submitted by the clinician, and then the lab gets the data, issues the report, and if negative, the data sits in the lab. Clinical notes are with the clinician, and there is no crosstalk, right? So. I think we need to think about more approaches that are able to automate information such that any new knowledge or any new phenotypic information is automatically triggered to flag those negative exons that might need to be reported back to the families. So this is where we are at now. And the rest of this is going to be more um, what I think is going to be coming uh, next. And if, if you've been to um, ASG last year, I'm sure you might have felt that RNA sequencing is actually here. Um, and the advantage of RNA sequencing is that similar to um, exome sequencing and genome sequencing, you might be able to catch pathogenic coding variants from mRNA. But the advantage is that you could also catch gene expression changes or aberrant um, splicing events due to deep intronic variants uh, or regulatory variants. Um, that you could also catch by whole genome, but you don't know what they mean. So I think the advantage of RNA sequencing it, is that it bridges this functional gap. It highlights those deep regulatory intronic variants that have functional impact on um, mRNA uh, the, the transcription and that are more likely to be pathogenic. Of course, the issue with RNA-seq is the tissue source. Uh, there were three or four papers, I think, that showed good success using muscle biopsies on neuromuscular disorders or skin fibroblasts on mitochondrial disorders. But what would you use for neurodevelopmental disorders and multiple congenital anomalies? I don't think brain or cortical tissue is going to be an option here. And we've actually looked at this problem and um, investigated the, the expression of 2,500 genes that are curated for neurodevelopmental disorders and found that there um, investigated their expression in lymphoblastoid cell lines, which are immortalized B cells that are relatively easy to make from patient cells, and found that a good proportion, 1,700 of those genes, are very well expressed in those cells. And they account for around 1,000 OMIM disorders. Most importantly, uh, the isoform expression of those genes mirrors quite significantly with that in the brain. So, because the issue here, if you have a, 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 an isoform that's expressed in the brain but not expressed in LCL, you still, it, that's not going to be useful. But we found that the brain-specific isoforms are still expressed in a good relative amount that would enable using LCLs to, uh, for RNA-seq and, and neurodevelopmental and multiple congenital anomalies. And so using this information, we did a pilot study. And so we used LCLs from CDLS uh, patient or Cornelia de Lange syndrome which is a multi-system, rare multi-system neurodevelopmental disorder caused by mutations in cohesin complex genes. Uh, we used uh, LCL for patients that have been clinically and molecularly diagnosed. So we know the DNA variants. 
those were nonsense, missense, frame shift variants, um, or splice events and copy number variants, and we found that we can catch those by RNA sequencing, including, in this example, a splice acceptor mutation at minus three, that we could see that it leads to skipping this exon 17 in this patient. So the, the original validation shows that RNA-seq from LCLs is a viable approach, and we're able to detect uh, sequence variants from mRNA in addition to these splice events that you would not see by DNA sequencing. Then we applied this on five patients that have a clinical diagnosis of Cornelia de Lange, um, but had received negative DNA testing. And interestingly, three out of five had a positive finding by RNA, including this family, where there is a deep intronic variant that led to cryptic exon inclusion, which led to frame shift uh, and uh, loss of function of the NPL gene. Interestingly, the two affected sibling carried this variant, which was not inherited from either parent, suggested that, yes, it's de novo, but there's more likely to be gonadal mosaicism. This work um, is online, just recently appeared online in Genetics and Medicine, and like I said, there have been four other papers um, that have used muscle or fibroblast and whole blood. Diagnostic yields somewhere between 7.5 and 35%, and I think these studies suffer from uh, low uh, sample sizes. And I think we need more, lar not only large samples, but we need them to be adequately investigated where exome sequencing and RNA sequencing done in parallel or sequentially in order to, in, to, to determine the, the yield of RNA-seq in this population. And so if we want to be optimistic and this tool is available um, for diagnostics, let's assume another 5% can be added. Um, and then we're still left with roughly 35 to 40% of patients who don't have a diagnosis. And remember, I think you might agree that as you get to 100%, every 1% becomes harder than the previous 65% because you have to think about more novel ways and new ways of thinking to capture that remaining diagnosis. And some of these started emerging. I'm sure many of you have seen um, polygenic risk scores, uh, methylation signatures uh, by, you know, Beckham Sadikovich in um, Western University, Canada. So the idea of polygenic risk scores is, um, is similar to GWAS, where you look at enrichment of common variants in patients compared to ethnically matched controls, and then you determine the effect sizes of these common variants and try to model them into a single score that would predict disease and has been successfully done in congenital heart disease and epilepsy this past year. And I do I think that there's gonna be more, more, more and more of these studies that will emerge and hopefully will help in investigating neurodevelopmental uh, patients. Uh, the key here is having right population. And so we need a large number of population and uh, ethnically matched ones. And like I mentioned, um, a group from Western University in Canada have found that um, the methylation signatures of 15 different neurodevelopmental disorders, including Kabuki syndrome and CHARGE and many others, are very unique. And they actually currently are using this as a diagnostic tool to diagnose those group of patients just by looking at their methylation profile without even finding a DNA variant. And this is very interesting because those DNA variants can be intronic or regulatory, so-called epimutations, but you're still able to to skip that gap and get the functional output and diagnose patients. And I think we're more and more moving, moving into this direction where we're trying to find um, novel ways to further query the genome. So what about uh, neurodevelopment genomic testing in the UE and actually any genetic disorder testing in the UE? I think we agree that there is lack of genomic diagnostics labs there is lack of centralized genetic disease knowledge databases, and what I mean by this is um, centers that do see the patients, genotype them, phenotype them, and build this genotype-phenotype bridge databases. I think we lack uh, a lot of this, and I'm sure we all know that we also lack the normal variation reference um, data set, as I mentioned earlier, and I think there's a severe shortage of genetic counseling. Um, I'll talk about this in a second. And so knowing all these gaps, Algeria Children's Specialty Hospital, which is the 
only pediatric specialty hospital in the UAE, decided to um, establish a genomic center of excellence with uh, basically three main components, a genomic diagnostics lab, uh, clinics, and research and education that is continually being um, uh, evolving with MBRU. I don't have time to talk about all of this, but we have our website, genomics.ae. You can go there, look at our um, the available testing menu, and look at our clinics, especially our genetic counseling clinics and joint clinics with other specialties. But I really want to talk to you more about our genomic diagnostics lab. Um, we have a built state-of-the-art uh, laboratory with the most advanced technologies, including Illumina NGS sequencing, droplet digital PCR, FMetrics microarrays, robotic liquid handling systems, in addition to lab informatics, bioinformatics tools, pipelines uh, to help us in analyzing complex testing like chromosomal microarrays, NGS, and exome sequencing. Uh, we have developed a very comprehensive diagnostic menu, including uh, NGS-based single-gene targeted NGS panels, um, exome sequencing, single or family-based trio quad quints. We also have a rapid exome uh, option for really critically ill uh, babies in the NICU. And we have this uh, approach that I mentioned to you earlier, the phenotype-driven exome panel or the exome slice, where we can look at any panel on the fly depending on the patient presentation. And we have also um, a range of non-NGS-based testing, including chromosomal microarray, uh, SNP microarrays, uh, targeted microdeletion testing, SMA, fragile X, and a, a bunch of methylation disorders. All this, every aspect of uh, these workflows from wet bench to analysis to interpretation have been optimized and validated using um, over 300 clinical samples that we obtained from premier centers in the U.S. Uh, we've developed SOPs, policies, and recently have gone through CAP accreditation. If you're here for this week, stop by and we can show you our really nice uh, facility and um, you can also meet the team. We are also, our uh, genetic test menu and more information about the lab is currently found in the GTR, or Genetic Test Registry, and, and hosted by the NCBI. All this work would not have been done without a really a great team that I'm lucky to be working with. So these are the experts from the wet bench to analysis, interpretation, counseling, bioinformatics. Um, and I think few, many of you may, might have seen their uh, posters yesterday. A few of them are here. If you haven't met them, I think um, maybe you can you know, talk to them and, and see what their experience is like. But I'm really grateful that uh, we have a very nice team and we've been really working hard over the past year. And um, I think we started seeing the fruits. Um, and I'll add the remaining slides. I'll show you some of our emerging uh, data that we've done over the past few months. So for CMA, uh, this test have been launched, I would say, since May of last year. And in 23 uh, cases that have been completed, mostly MRTs and presentations, as you might uh, think, are mostly in, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Our diagnostic yield was around 10%. However, half of our patients had extensive loss of hydros uh, heterozygosity, which is expected given the high rate of consanguinity. And in these patients, we would recommend doing exome sequencing and focusing on those autozygous regions. SMA testing, we've done around 20 of those. Mostly, actually, these are coming from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the next would um, Saudi Arabia and Emiratis. We had 20 of those. Uh, the main presentation is muscle weakness. And this diagnostic yield is the highest I've ever seen. It's 40%. And as you know, there are um, you know, treatment options for those patients, including Spinraza and the recent uh, gene therapy. Sequencing, NGS sequencing, this has been launched for two months and we've already gone through 21 uh, orders. Um, this is a mix of targeted NGS panels, exome sequencing, exome slice across different um, specialties and our diagnostic yield is 70%. We'll see how this will hold, but this is very, very high, I think, compared to what I've shown you, and at least my experience in this uh, realm. Um, some mutations have not been seen in other, um, have not been published or has not been seen in other disease databases. So in addition to, you know, 
um, building our own database and you know contributing a genomic diagnostic service. I think I mentioned to you earlier the issue with a lack of the Emirati reference or normal variation. Uh, I have a couple of slides to just you know explain this. Um, when you do exome sequencing, a really strong, powerful filter that we use. If we sequence any one of our exomes, we get you know close to 100,000 variants. And one filter that we use is we try to filter out variants that are found in the general population at say 0.1%, so one in a thousand, under the assumption that there shouldn't be a variant that causes a rare, severe pediatric disorder at this frequency. So when you apply this filter with a ESP, exome sequencing project, which has only 6,000 Caucasians and North African, um, African Americans, you're still left with around 1,200 variants. But if you expand this to exact, which has 60,000 uh, individuals, you could see that the number of variants that survive are much less, right? They're less than 500. But how is, what is the utility of this database in the Emirati or the local population that we're testing? Right, so we have actually looked into this on, for a few exomes, Emirati and Western exomes. Um, and, you know, like I said, in this, we have roughly 60,000 variants after putting some QC metric filtrations. And if we use NOMAD, which has 140,000 um, individuals, and we select 0.5% of the frequency as a cutoff, you can see it's still quite efficient in dropping down the number of surviving variants to roughly around 1,000 variants, both in Emirati and Western exomes. But you see it's still slightly elevated. So if you zoom into this, it's actually very significant. So there's a few hundred variants that are still compared to Western exome that are surviving with um, the Emirati exomes. But since we're doing this testing in-house and we're building our own internal reference, we can apply our internal reference, reference cohort and we see that we're, we're already offsetting this gap in terms of you know, lowering down the number of variants that are um, uh, uh, still there for annotation and interpretation. So in general, I think we've been, you know, um, working hard towards closing um, a gap that um, mainly uh, around genomic diagnostics. We have, we are start, we're starting to build our disease knowledge database, um, and I think in time, we hope that our database will help us understand the genetic landscape of several genetic disorders. Like I said, we're already building a normal reference for internal data sets, and not just for sequencing, we're also actually finding copy number variants that are more common in this population, and that's really helpful in, in streamlining interpretation and you know, um, in, uh, improving the quality of the test. And we have really, I think, um, um, introduced genetic counseling in the most efficient way. Uh, you know, I've heard about lots of projects uh, around this region. People focus on machines and uh, data centers and not much focus on genetic counseling. I think much of the success we've had is because of implementing genetic counseling in the hospital and uh, coupling them with other non-genetic clinicians. Um, I don't have time to talk over this um, more, but if, if you are around during Arab Health, we actually, Alan, who's our genetic counselor, and myself will be giving talks. Maybe you can hear from Alan more about his genetic counseling experience. And it's the date actually where we will have our official genomics launch. Also in February 27th, we have um, a genomic, clinical genomics symposium at Al Jalila Children's Hospital. It's uh, CME and it's free. So if you can come, please do. We have experts in the region to talk about uh, clinical genomics. Um, and at the end, I would like to thank Again, the organizers, uh, CAGS, Dr. Mahmoud, the audience, I would like to thank the wonderful team I have in the hospital management. If you think my slides are complicated, I hope this one is uh, much easier. And I would ask the organizers to tell me what polypeptide would that code for. Thanks for sure. Happy to take questions.